Hi, I'm John Long, and welcome to Yosemite. There's probably no better place in the world to learn how to rock climb, and I suspect there's a handful of you out there who someday challenge these colossal walls, some of the biggest and best in the world. Now, our class can never hope to replace actual hands-on instruction, because you learn best by doing. We can, however, bring into focus all the fundamentals basic to a safe and enjoyable experience. Our class is based on the Yosemite system, which emphasizes simplicity and safety. And don't be confused by all the knots and terminologies and technology. They all apply to basic, simple principles. Like any other sport, climbing is a matter of grades and degrees. Let's take a look at those. This then is first class. I need no previous climbing experience to walk from here to the bar to order myself a non-alcoholic beverage. Second class is essentially moderate hiking. We encounter some kind of terrain. Trail, perhaps. We're sliding along a riverbank. Hey, hey, ladies! I got a rope and a car and a bee, and I got other things to do too. This is third class. The hands are used for balance. Often the terrain is steep and strenuous. There's no uniform rule when to rope up on this kind of terrain. But if you feel more comfortable with the rope, by all means, use it. Hip rope! Fourth class is when the terrain is steep enough to where a fall may prove to be fatal. Even an experienced climber like myself will often want a rope on fourth class terrain. We've been having a good time, but once you get here, you gotta bear down. This is fifth class or technical rock climbing where rope and equipment are always employed. Our class will focus primarily on fifth class climbing. When the rock becomes too steep to climb using hand or footholds, there is still a select few foolish enough to want to carry on. The method is called sixth class or direct aid climbing, where the equipment absorbs all of my body weight. Mechanically, I ascend this. In reference to beginning rock climbing, sixth class or direct aid is a little more than a curiosity. This is it in its most fundamental form. That should be clear enough, eh? The only thing left for us is to go climbing. You can break climbing down to two basic elements, the physical ascending and the use of equipment to minimize the risk. Before we set boot to rock, and that there is a mighty big rock, let's get familiar with the gear. The most fundamental piece of equipment in fifth class climbing is the rope, the lifeline between the two climbers. Over the years, there's been a dramatic evolution in the quality of the rope, whereas in the past, people used to use yachting ropes, white line, hemp, even on occasion, a clothesline, if we were to believe them. The standard rope now is a kern mantle rope, which involves a woven nylon sheath over a braided core. Standard dimensions for the Kern Mantle Rope are 11 millimeters in diameter by 165 feet in length. This rope has tremendous dynamic qualities which absorb much of the energy when generated in a fall. These ropes do not simply break, though on rare occasions they're known to be cut over a serrated edge or shattered by falling rock. There are three things in particular we have to be conscious of in terms of rope care. The first is never step on the rope because it grinds unnecessary particles into the sheath. Second, do not expose the rope to unnecessary sunlight, which will greatly reduce the strength of the rope over a long period of time. And third, keep chemicals as far away from the rope as you can in terms of gasoline, turpentine, etc. So, unless a rope is abused by long falls, chemicals, or unnecessary sunlight, a rope is generally good until the sheath wears through. Falling! <laughs> the simplest and strongest method of tying into the rope is with a swami belt. Complicated harnesses are not necessarily any better and are definitely not stronger. 
A standard Swami belt consists of three to four wraps of two inch tubular nylon webbing secured with a water knot. As with other knots you'll soon see, the water knot is a follow through knot. Here, you tie an overhand knot. Find the end. Now with the free end, you follow the aforementioned end back to the origin. In the end, knots take practice. This video will best serve you as a guide to compare your efforts against. Don't forget to leave yourself a tail. Secure those ends with a half hitch, then slide the whole rig out of harm's way. Leg loops are used in conjunction with the swami belt to form a complete harness. Any viable set of leg loops will feature a keeper sling in the back, which keep the loops from slipping down too low. Since leg loops are reasonably inexpensive, go for a quality pair. If you have to hang in them at all, you'll want a perfect fit, snug, but not constricting. The green sling, then, is the keeper sling. It comes up and over the swami belt, then clips into the opposite leg. There are virtually hundreds of harnesses on a day's market. The key question is, does your harness have a double pass-through buckle, as this one does? If so, make sure that tail passes through the buckle, twice. In the past, harnesses were cumbersome, uncomfortable, and had design flaws, which resulted in a falling climber being wrenched upside down or sideways when the rope came taut. They also could do grievous damage to a man's private parts. Contemporary designs have eliminated these problems, so essentially, whatever method you choose is a matter of personal choice. A climber will sometimes find himself lashed to the cliffside in full hang positioning. Here, the swami belt is the worst option, as it puts all the weight on the back. A harness takes that weight off your back and onto the gams, much more comfortable. We've looked at the swamis, the leg loops, and the harnesses. Let's take a close look at the knot we use to tie in with. There's one and only one recommended knot to tie into the rope, a double figure eight. Grab the last two feet of the cord, make a loop, pass the end around the horn and back down the hole to form a single figure eight. The tail is then passed through the harness, then the end traces the eight configuration back out in reverse. She will now attempt to re-thread a double figure eight, which indeed is a very difficult knot. She's on the back nine, coming around the horn, She's on the fairway now. She's gonna have to pull that tight and hook it right. That's hook it right, a difficult move at this juncture. No, 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 there it is. She's out of the rough and home free. Quite a tee shot there. She's bringing it down, it's in the hole. Remember, this is your one and only tie-in. So for peace of mind, leave yourself enough of a tail to periodically give it a good yank. No, 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 you need a pair of needle-nose pliers to grab that. And ho, daddy, what's with a loop flipper could jump through that? Get that knot close to the harness. Perfecto. Aside from a rope, a carabiner is the most basic piece of equipment used in rock climbing. In the simplest terms, a carabiner is an aluminum alloy snap link with a spring-loaded gate used to connect various pieces of the climbing chain together such as a rope to an anchor. They come in all kinds of different configurations, sizes, and dimensions. This one's called an oval. The next most popular model is called the D, like that one. And they're both used for exactly the same purposes. Under certain rare circumstances, it might be possible, such as when you're pulling a bag up the face of the cliff, that the gate could be forced open by an edge or a rock or whatnot. Under those circumstances and ones like it, you want to use a locking carabiner which has this device on it which you spin towards the top of the gate and that keeps the gate from coming open. Now one thing you must understand that a locking carabiner is not necessarily any stronger than an oval or a D or anything else. All it does is ensure that the gate does not come open. The carabiner is constructed to be extremely strong lengthwise like this. That's the way it is meant to be used. And in that manner, the carabiner is exceptionally strong. Usually, you'll find on the gate a number which is punched in. In this instance, it's 2,000 kilograms, which is better than 4,000 pounds. The carabiner is not meant to be pulled out on the gate as such. 
If you do that, a carabiner is only as strong as the little pin there that goes into the mouth of the carabiner there. So under no circumstances are you to set this up or any piece of your system so there is direct pull out on the gate. How then do we secure the rope to the cliff? This used to be accomplished with pitons, which were driven into cracks in the rock. As climbing became more popular, a less destructive method of protection had to be devised. The solution then was nuts or chalk stones. These are basically tapered pieces of aluminum or metal fitted with a rope sling or wired cable, and these in turn are placed in constrictions in the crack. Traditional chalk stones come in two different designs. The first, commonly called a stopper, has a distinctive wedge shape to it. It can be placed either the thin way, like such, or the wide way, as such. When a climber searches for a nut placement, he ideally looks for a constriction in the crack, the taper of which corresponds exactly to the taper of the nut. Generally, the more surface area of nut to rock, the better the placement. The second is called a hexcentric. And owing to the many different angles and sides to it, it affords the climber four distinctive attitudes for placement. One, two, three, and even sideways, four. While stoppers can usually find a ready purchase in appropriate slots, you'll often have to work a little harder to find that perfect hex placement. You'll also want to give hexcentrics a good tug just to set them so the drag of the rope doesn't lift them from the crack. One of the most ingenious and successful inventions in the last 10 years has been the Friend. These were originally designed for parallel sided cracks where traditional nut cannot find purchase. Each of the four lobes or cams work independently of the other. When you pull down on this trigger, the ratio becomes thin. When you ease off, as they are spring-loaded, they fan back out. The ideal friend placement is in a perfectly parallel sided crack, where the lobes are at mid-range. To remove the friend, simply depress the trigger and lift it on out. If the crack is too big for the lobes, the lobes tip out. And that ain't no friend at all. Sometimes moving the friend as little as an inch can find that perfect placement. A sling is one of our most fundamental pieces of equipment. Essentially, it is a five-foot piece of one-inch tubular nylon webbing secured with a water nut. The runner has many applications and remains the climber's mainstay in securing natural acres, be it slinging a tree or slinging a flake of rock. An anchor is our method of attaching a rope to the cliff. An old Yosemite ace once told me, if you don't have a great anchor, you ain't got nothing. Our first choice of an anchor is always a natural one, a stout tree or a big block of stone. If unavailable, we must use our equipment to construct an artificial one. Whatever our choice of an anchor is, it must be strong enough to withstand the force of the biggest possible fall. Once Felix has completed his lead, he first eyeballs around for an anchor. Ah, uh, yes, a stout, albeit squatty, Jeffrey Pine. Again, the runner comes into play, and he ties it off nice and low. He'll use not one, but two carabiners. The knot he will use to tie in with is called a figure eight on a bite. Doubled, he forms a loop, it comes around and back down through the hole. When he ties in, he will make sure that the two carabiners have opposing gates. Just a little extra insurance to make sure his anchor is bomb proof. Another popular knot is the overhand on a bite. A good knot, but a little tougher to untie once it's been weighted. For natural anchors, it's hard to beat a beefy block of rock. 
To construct an artificial anchor, we find the best section of crack and employ the appropriate nuts, or in this case, friends. The key here is direction of pull, and we always place a gear with this in mind. Once the anchor has been established, we're left to tie it all together, this usually accomplished with a runner. Now, personally, I think the second nut in that configuration looks a little off. Yeah, there he is, Felix. He's got it right. Bomb proof. Should we need to equalize the anchors, we simply put a half twist on the runner. Then, we put another half twist on one side. Clip through both sides, and we have a sliding equalizer, which distributes the pull from any angle. In constructing an artificial anchor, we most frequently use different pieces of gear. Here, we have an opposition anchor, the bottom nut safeguarding against an upward pull. A bolt is one of the most common forms of fixed anchor. A hole is first drilled, then the split flange stud is driven in. Seemingly infallible, they sometimes fail. So use some common sense before trusting them. Fixed pitons are also common. But even though they may appear bomb-proof, be sure to test them. Again, a bomb-proof anchor is tantamount to safe climbing. Let's look at what happens when it's less than ideal. Felix here is maxed. One false move, and he's off big time. Hence, the anchor must be sound, and that one is poor. Ah! Old Felix took a 300 football, and the Blair learned his lesson the hard way. Felix only fell 50 feet this time. In the last 10 years, few things have helped revolutionize the sport like these, fee rays. The first boot to utilize a super sticky sole which adheres two, maybe even three times better than every boot before them. Rock climbing is a sport specialized enough to where you'll definitely want a pair of shoes. Without them, it's like going ice skating without skates. Nothing hones up your technique and strength faster than bouldering or practicing on small rocks. It's also the fastest way to get hurt because whenever you fall off, you hit the ground. So always keep your eyes peeled for things you can fall onto, and whenever possible, use a spotter. Bouldering has become so popular that really, it's a separate sport. A climber can max himself and try problems he would never try under normal circumstances. If there's ever any doubt about taking a bad fall, just make sure you use a spotter. Amazing things have been done on the boulders, chiefly because the climber has little worry about the fall. There's any number of ways to do the same problem, too. safer method still is top rope. When an anchor is set on top, the rope was doubled through. One end for the climber, and one end for the blayer. When setting up a top rope, make sure the anchor extends over any sharp edge. Extend it with a runner if need be. Leading is the name of the game, being out on the sharp end. 
a matter of judgment and experience, things we can't teach. We can, however, take a real close look at the techniques involved. The leader protects himself by placing equipment at strategic spots. Thus, he limits his fall to twice the distance above his highest placement. When and where to place protection is strictly the leader's prerogative. is the person who seconds the rope, taking all the equipment out. There is no danger for this man or woman because the rope runs above him, generally the position I like to be in. You see that back there? <laughs> That's over 75 miles away, 8,000 feet of vertical granite. They call it a big wall because it's a mighty big wall, so big in fact that no one man can climb it in one day. So any wall so big, so grand, so colossal that it cannot be climbed in one day is a big wall. So is that. I'm going big wall climbing. See ya. Your lady, your lady. Free soloing or climbing without a rope graphically illustrates the fact that the risks are there if you want to take them. Over the last eight Maybe 10 years, free soloing has become increasingly popular, but bear in mind that chief practitioners are generally climbers with eight, even 10 years experience. But even for them, accidents do occur, and generally they're fatal. A belay is our chief line of defense in stopping a falling climber. It is a technique which must be executed with absolute certainty. Despite alternatives, the hip belay is the fundamental method of belaying. The rope is wrapped around the climber's hams, and with one hand, the left in this instance, serves as the brake hand. In the event of a fall, the brake hand comes across the body, and the combined friction is adequate to secure the rope. The popular and recent method is the Munter hitch, a hitch which locks upon itself in a fall. The device, rather than your back, absorbs much of the stress generated in the fall. To tie it, make a loop, cross it over the juncture and clip the double section into the carabiner. The hitch slides both ways when feeding rope out and when taking rope in. In a fall, the brake end simply comes off to the side, securing the hitch on the carabiner. Another popular device is the sticked plate, which works on the same principle as that other German apparatus. A bite comes up through the stick plate and clips into the carabiner. In the event of a fall, the rope is locked between the plate and the carabiner. Once again, in this instance, the left hand is a brake hand and it comes off to the side securing the hitch. The last device is a figure eight descending ring, generally used for a rappel, though it works equally well as the belay device. The belay can vary from a stately ledge to a hanging stance. Communication between the climber is very important. Even before the climber steps off the ground, certain signals must be exchanged. On belay. Belay's on. Climbing. Climb. As the ascent proceeds, 
Other signals must be used. Up rod. In other words, take up the slack, but not so much where she's held on tension. That's not free climbing. Slack. If she comes on to tension or has to move down, you'll have to feed a little bit of rope out. More than anything else, climbing is a game of techniques. Quack climbing techniques, face climbing techniques, all kinds of techniques. Bear in mind, just like any other sport, it takes years to master all of these techniques. Finesse, fitness, all kinds of things come into play. Let's take a look at the fundamentals. With open face climbing, where you're principally interested in hand and foothold, Maintaining correct body position is half the battle. Note how the climber does not hug the rock, but remains vertical with his weight directly over his feet. There are as many different kinds of holes as there are ways of grabbing them. Edges, where the fingers crimp down directly upon a sharp edge. Rounded holes, where the friction of the fingertips is the key. And side poles. The combination, the variety, it's infinite. Another standard move is a mantle shelf, or how you surmount a big hole. Here it's done with relative ease. In its extreme form on overhanging rock, a mantle can be nasty indeed. With face climbing, footwork is the single most important element. The most basic move is the friction step. Another basic move is the smear, where the boot is smeared upon a sloping hole. Edge, then, is a hold much better defined. Again, body position is a key. Always keep the weight directly over the feet. Quack climbing, then, is a different animal altogether. Note the variety of different jamming techniques. Lie backing, perhaps the most strenuous technique. Finger jamming, painful indeed. Hand jamming, far and away the most secure. Foot jamming. Fist jamming. Offsize, a dreaded technique, where the quack becomes too wide to jam an appendage. And chimney. Finally, stemming, perhaps the most elegant of all climbing techniques.
once we get up here, we've got to get down. The method we use is called rappelling. Far and away the most dangerous practice in all of rock climbing. The reason is we have to put complete trust in our equipment and our anchor. Basically, there are two ways to get down. One employs a figure of eight, and the other employs carabiners. The carabiner brake first involves clipping two carabiners through the harness or the swami and leg loops. Notice how the gates are opposed. Two additional carabiners are clipped onto these two, also with the gates opposed. A bite of rope is then brought up through the second group of carabiners. And one, two, possibly even three carabiners are fitted between with the gates down. This way, the top of the carabiner acts as a brake system, which the rope runs over. One last check, then it's over the lip. The figure of eight first involves a locking carabiner, which is fitted through the swami and the leg loops or the harness. A bite of rope is slipped up through the big hole in the figure eight, then slid around the small hole, which in turn clips in to the locking carabiner. This device provides adequate friction for a safe rappel. With any rappel device, the brake hand, in this instance the right hand, regulates the speed of descent. Want to go slower? Just wrap that rope around the hip. An emergency method is the dolphur sets, or body rappel. And you better be well clothed if you want to use this one. Body position is very important. The rappeller will always want to keep the upper body perpendicular to the cliff and always maintain a smooth and steady rate of descent. The knot used to tie two ropes together is a grapevine knot. I defy someone to be able to describe this in words. Best to just watch this example and practice on your own. No need to wear out that rewind button. Here it is up close. The most common method of retrieving the rope is to double the rope through the anchor. Once a climber reaches the ground, he is free to pull one end of the rope, thus retrieving both. But better watch it when that rope comes down. Rope! With that, then, we've covered all the fundamentals to modern rock climbing. Let's move on to an actual climb and see if we can't put the whole process together.
Rarely does a rope stretch the top of a given climb. The consequence then is multi-pitch or multi-rope length climbing. The lead is usually leapfrog. He who follows the first pitch inherits the lead on the second. Well, if there's ever any doubt whether that rope's going to reach the ground, tie yourself a big girthy knot in the end just to make sure you don't rappel clean off the line. That about does it for us. I hope you had a good time. Like we said at the outset, we can never hope to replace actual hands-on instruction, but hopefully we brought it into focus all the fundamentals basic to the safe and enjoyable experience we all want. The rest is up to you. Happy climbing. <laughs>